Hi everyone, my name is Domenico. I'm the director of the Robotics Research Center in NTU. I would like to take you through some of the research activities that we undertake here at the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in NTU. First of all, there are quite a bunch of us. You can think of more than 50, 60 people, uh, including professors, technicians, research associates, and uh, of course, PhD students who are the uh, the real force of our lab. And this number does not even include the dozens and dozens of uh, undergraduate students who every semester orbit around our lab for some form of training or maybe to develop their robotic ideas. So, um, as I said, uh, let me just give you a, a quick overview of our um, uh, work at uh, RRC. First of all, in terms of uh, activities, we really span the whole spectrum of technology readiness level, or TRL. Well, uh, this uh, TRL goes from level one to level nine. Level one is really basic research. Level one, you can think of the very eureka moment you have when you wake up with your very great idea. But these eureka moments often die young, so you need to test your ideas and bring them all the way up to the scale uh, to see if it really becomes a, a final product. Well, not all the ideas become final products. In this uh, short overview, I will show you ideas which are very basic and still needs years to, um, to be developed, other ideas which are already applied, and ideas that already became uh, a final product. Well, only 50 of us and how can we do this well uh, first of all we the key word is collaboration the robotic research center in ntu actually collaborates with different entities for example we collaborate with a star or artc which is the advanced remanufacturing research center and is located in ntu but we also collaborate with uh, top uh, worldwide uh, um, industries. Uh, you see, for example, Rolls Royce, L, ST Engineering. And this industry actually came to NTU because they have global top problem and they need our help to solve them through. We also have uh, a lot of research that deals with healthcare. And for example, the Rehabilitation Research Institute of Singapore helps us coordinate with the various hospitals here in Singapore. Let's look at some more details. Let's start with the very big basic research. Some of this research really is at the beginning and maybe can be characterized as the crazy idea some of us have. Let's start with uh, Professor Sato. Professor Sato is behind the so-called cyborg insect. You might have heard of it in the news. Uh, the idea is that he really uses live beetles and embeds basically a backpack, technological backpack on these beetles. So these beetles, again, are live and kicking. And what they do is carrying around this communication backpack. And this backpack co connects to their peripheral uh, nervous system. So why is, uh, what could be an application of this research? Well, let me tell you. If I found myself uh, uh, trapped in a collapsed building, well, I have more hopes that a little bug like this would find me than the best robot robot ever made to date. Let's see some examples of that. So uh, what it can do is to basically uh, trigger on and off certain mechanisms that uh, are behind the uh, takeoff and land. So he can actually trigger when the speed of should take off and when they should land. More importantly, he can steer these beetles in flight. So with the remote control, he can actually uh, tell the beetle whether to fly left or right. And he can induce all sorts of behaviors. So you can see butterfly style or crawl, you name it. Um, so beetles are good at walking and finding, for example, survivors, but you need to give some directions. So what is working on is really to, to, to find a way to guide these beetles for a task that is of interest to humans. All right, he's been using real insects, and Mother Nature did a lot of work there. Uh, one of the things that we are doing is to actually look at uh, the way Mother Nature solved some of the problems. So Mother Nature had millions of years to, to evolve their, its system. So uh, we are taking inspiration from nature and develop things that, for example, fly, as in this case, this is a miniature, basically flapping flight mechanism, or perhaps swim. This uh, nice looking fish is actually a robot. Uh, it swims very naturally, 
you see it in a tank. And all it does in this case is to really float, swim, and turn direction whenever a, a wall is approaching. So again, this is called biomimetic robotics and is basically taking inspiration from nature, from the very principle behind locomotion such as swimming or flying, and then using whatever engineering uh, materials and methods we have at our disposal to reproduce these mechanisms. Let's move ahead. Um, another type of robot is actually uh, in the micro, uh, micrometer domain. This is done by Professor Lum. So Professor Lum, inspired by this tiny creatures has developed basically uh, small rubber-like structures with uh, embedded magnets. These embedded magnets can turn, twist and turn in the presence of a magnetic field. By having a, a magnetic field, uh, you see an example here, B is the ma external magnetic field, he can use all sorts of shapes formations and he can induce this tiny agents to really jump, swim, move across different media. An application, very futuristic, you can imagine a swarm of these little creatures inside your stomach to perform a surgery from the inside and then to be expelled by natural mechanisms. More standard robotics. Well, we have our colleague, Professor Pham. He's actually into industrial type of robots and he has developed this amazing uh, video where he, two of his robots are actually able to complete the assembly of an IKEA chair. Start to end. So how does he achieve this? Well, let me uh, show you this video again because it's very fast. First of all, he uses uh, the sense of touch for these robots. These robots are endowed with uh, four sensors and, and they are able to sense, for example, when a pin is actually being inserted into a hole. The issue here is that, yes, IKEA chairs have a pre-designed uh, holes to insert a peg in, but there is a lot of variability. So for sure, the robot can come close to it and then search for it. Let me show you this video again. Now, the robot on the right will try to uh, search for the hole and insert. Look now at this motion. This is the searching motion, and then the other robot will insert once the hole is found. Uh, let's go now into more applied type of research. So this research has been developed in collaboration with many other institutes. Um, for example, again, Professor Pham is using his robots this time on wheels uh, to actually uh, enlarge the workspace for 3D printing. What you see here are basically robots with spe um, special nozzle uh, designed to eject concrete. Uh, with this, these robots can actually walk inside a building and creates the structures that are needed for the interior of a building, not the structural one, but more the, the, the interior uh, structures. Uh, other forms of 3D printing can be, for example, the ones that relate to biomaterials. So um, the advantage of robots is that they really can move in 3D space and they can orient themselves in 3D space. It would be a, a major difference with the current 3D printing which is often layer by layer. These robots will know about, for example, the curvature of our own uh, skin and uh, body shapes, and will be able to develop, for example, uh, membranes which have the very specific curvature that is needed to uh, conform, for example, to our elbow. All right, let me come now to a very important part of our research, the um, robots that deal with humans. Um, so. Uh, we have uh, robot-human collaborations under different perspectives. For example, we have medical robots. In this case, the robot is designed to really uh, augment the surgeon. Remember, the surgeon is a person with um, great skills. It took uh, years, if not decades, to develop certain skills. And the robot is there to augment. For example, augment precision. Uh, great surgeons, nevertheless, get old and they uh, um, tremble just uh, any of us. Well, the robot can help stabilize the motion of a surgeon and be more accurate, for example, when cutting through bones or making some sort of incisions. On the other end of the spectrum, you have rehabilitation and assistive robots. Here, the user is still a human, but in this case, because of a trauma or a disease, the human might have lost some skills. So these robots actually assist 
this human, impaired human, to actually regain, to relearn certain motor skills that are lost due to a trauma or a disease. Then there are robots that are more social. They interact with us not on a physical level, but more on a social level. So they understand what they're trying to say, but even they understand our uh, body motion, our gestures. So. Uh, if you want to communicate and work together with a robot, well, the robot needs to understand some of the basic uh, uh, body language um, forms of communication that are typical in humans. Very recently, uh, we have moved these paradigms, which are typical of healthcare, into manufacturing. So now the uh, user is actually the operator. Again, just like the surgeon, the operator is someone who has developed skills over years and years of training. And here, the robot can actually help the operator develop, uh, deploy some, uh, for example, industrial uh, tooling tasks. All right, uh, speaking of human robotics, it's way more complex than just robotic itself. Definitely you have robotic technologies and you also have artificial intelligence technologies, but it all has to do with neuroscience. So there is the need to understand the, the, the intrinsic human behaviors and also social sciences. You need to know where to deploy such technologies. You need to know about the population you are trying to, to, to work with. And all the way to mathematics, we do use a great deal of mathematics in the form, for example, of game theory to actually develop artificial uh, intelligence agents which are able to uh, work with us. Here's an example of two people who cooperate with each other through the means of a robot. So, we have uh, a lot of activities in the field of healthcare, and this is one example of uh, uh, devices. For example, devices that can be worn by a, a, a patient, or maybe devices that you can bring home. Uh, it's very easy to bring home an iPad, but it becomes way more complicated to bring home a robot, uh, starting with safety issues. Well, we are working towards that. We are really decentralizing healthcare. So we are developing robots that can go from the hospitals to community centers and in the long run, all the way to home. Let me give you an example now of the upper end of the spectrum. Basically, these are, uh, this is a list of robotic startups that came out from our lab. We have, for example, uh, this um, company, Transformer, and what they do is basically developing this type of robots who are able to come into a building, scan the surfaces, and deploy a, a given layer of coating with amazing precision. Or maybe other robots that can stroll around the uh, building at night when nobody is uh, there to, to perform security checks um, of all sorts. We have the other robots like Eureka Robotics by Professor Pham, who's actually uh, great in uh, um, factory automation, especially in unstructured environments where things are never the same. This is the greatest challenge for robots to operate in presence of vulnerability. We have robots uh, who are actually handheld and can help the surgeon. Uh, achieve much better accuracy. Uh, and then we have, for example, surgical robots. These robots are meant to be uh, operating from within our body. So they enter through a natural orifices, for example, through your mouth to perform operation on from within your stomach. And as you can see from this picture, these robots are very challenging. They must give the surgeon the same dexterity the surgeon would have with bare hands, but at a much, much lower scale. Then we have robots for rehabilitation. These robots can actually read your thoughts and uh, deliver the uh, proper amount of training. And finally, we have robots that actually work with you our home and they train your uh, muscle recovery after, for example, stroke. Well, this was a very short overview of our activities. I hope to see you in, in, the, in our labs. Uh, all the best. Thank you very much for your attention.